Hebble. <laughs> okay, hear me out on this. The Cat in the Hat movie is not that bad. Son of a bitch! Released to incredibly poor critical reception in 2003, the movie has received even more ridicule in the last decade, becoming a punching bag for online film reviewers. Get out of my way, you hippie freak. Now don't get me wrong, it's certainly not a good movie either. It's got a long list of problems which I'll get to, but once you look beyond them, what's left is a movie that's a visually inventive reimagining of a beloved children's book. A book that I'll point out is only 61 pages. Was anyone honestly expecting this movie not to take a few creative liberties in turning this story into a feature film? You should not be here when your mother is out. Come on, kids, you gonna listen to him? He drinks where he pees. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it was the first movie to drastically reinvent Dr. Seuss characters. Hug her up and kiss it, Hoobell! <laughs> But this movie should at least be praised for its production design and practical effects. It may not feel like the world in a Dr. Seuss story, but it certainly looks like one. Despite this, the movie's negative reception was enough for Dr. Seuss's widow to put an end to any future live-action adaptations of his work, because surely animation could possibly do nothing to disgrace his work. I've always found the cynicism towards this movie to be kind of harsh though, and the things that most critics find wrong with the movie are the elements that I actually like. Oh yeah! <laughs> so let's journey back to 2003 to discuss a movie that's not that bad to me. This is the story of a film that's not that great, but surely one that doesn't deserve so much hate. <laughs> Let's get this party started! I guess we should start by talking about another Dr. Seuss movie, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I remember being at the movie theater sometime around 1999, looking at the posters in that hallway before you would exit the theater. In the days before I had access to the internet, it was my only way to really discover what movies would be coming soon. To this day, I'll never forget seeing this teaser poster. It was so minimal, yet so effective. It immediately hyped me and a lot of kids up for the movie. The Grinch was a huge marketing machine for the production company Imagine Entertainment, as well as DreamWorks and Universal. There were action figures, talking dolls, even a video game. Of course, there were also countless Christmas ornaments and apparel, too. It's so ironic looking back now that a movie that was all about the true spirit of Christmas was such a commercial behemoth for the studio. A slew of lucky people will get all their Visa holiday purchases free, because Visa and the Grinch are giving back the holidays. From November through December, it all can be free, because Visa is everywhere you want to be. Opening just in time for the holiday season, the movie became the sixth highest grossing film of the year. It even won an Oscar, rightfully so, for makeup. Being that DreamWorks had acquired not just the film rights to the Grinch, but also several other of Dr. Seuss's characters, they fast-tracked the live-action Cat in the Hat adaptation set to come out three years after the Grinch. The script was to be written by Alec Berg, David Mandel, and Jeff Schaefer, three guys whose most noteworthy credit up to that point was writing for Seinfeld, and writing pretty acclaimed episodes at that. Guys with cats. I don't know. <laughs> The movie would be helmed by Bo Welch, making his feature film director debut. He had previously worked as a production designer on films like Beetlejuice, Ghostbusters 2, and Men in Black. While Tim Allen was the original choice for the cat, by the time his script was completed, he had already committed to the Santa Claus 2, and the world would have to wait until 2006 to see him as a personified pet. Oh no! So with Tim Allen out, Mike Myers was brought in to replace him. Apparently, Myers being cast was the result of him backing out of Universal's planned Sprockets film, after a great deal of funds had already been spent on pre-production. He was then sued by Imagine Entertainment, who alleged, Myers has followed a pattern and practice of breaking his promises, betraying the trust of others, and causing serious damage to those with whom he deals through selfish, egomaniacal, and irresponsible conduct. And then, those same people hired him for the Cat in the Hat. Awkward. 
I'm still unclear on the details, but I guess the lawsuit was settled out of court, and it was ruled that Myers owed the production company a film performance. You're being a good sport. What's that? You're being a good sport seems hard. <laughs> it's, it's... <laughs> oh, bad. Regardless, it's a casting choice that actually makes a lot of sense to me. At the time, Myers was no stranger to having to undergo heavy prosthetics to portray his characters. He was also a huge box office draw. With kids through Shrek, and with teens and adults through the Austin Powers franchise. I know he can be an acquired taste, but his comedy talent is undeniable. Much like Carrie with The Grinch, Myers definitely knew how to make the character his own. First book I ever read was Cat and Hat. First book I ever read to me was Cat and Hat. Yeah. And my mom used to read it in a, in a Liverpool accent because she's from Liverpool. Right. And uh, so for me, it was like, you know, in this box of two things, I will show them to you. Two things and I call them thing one and thing two, like, you know, so <laughs> the little, for me, it was like they talk like the Beatles, you know, on the Cat and the Hat. <laughs> Turn left at Greenland, you know. <laughs> At the time, Myers said he wanted to make the role an iconic portrayal similar in vain to Gene Wilder's take on Willy Wonka. But to Myers' credit, he does give the cat a sarcastic, menacing edge, even if it is played to the extreme. There is a third option. There is? Yes, it involves murder. I guess some people also have cited the look of the cat to be a little unnerving, but honestly, I think he looks pretty good. Because in the book, he's got a long neck and a round face and huge eyes, and you realize that you're not going to make it look like the real cat in the hat. You're trying to create an impression. And I know just the guys to do it. <laughs> I mean, if the last few years have taught us anything, it's that human-cat hybrids could be far more unnerving and annoying to look at on screen. Humongous. I prefer the term big bone to jolly. I actually think the movie's biggest problem is not using the cat enough. He enters on page 6 of the book, yet here it takes 17 minutes before he appears on screen. And that 17 minutes is made up of some of the worst elements of the movie. FIRE! <laughs> Much like the Grinch adaptation, this movie finds the need to pile so much dramatic stakes onto the story. I wish I had a different mom. Well, sometimes I wish the same thing. Wait, so wouldn't that mean that she's wishing for a different mom, too? For starters, their brother and sister don't get along and don't know how to have fun, while their mom is incredibly overworked. She has this demanding boss played by Sean Hayes, who is by far the most irritating character in the film. He's forcing her to host the client party at her home that evening, and to top it all off, she has a jerk boyfriend who is pushing for her son to go to military school. I will say that despite this boyfriend character being kind of pointless, at least Alec Baldwin has fun with the role, and then inexplicably also returned to record an audio commentary. Oh, oh my god. I can't tell you how many people said to me, what have you done to yourself? <laughs> They said, was that really your gut? This and is I the said, highlight. You know, I've let movie. myself go in my 40s. Look, I understand it's a movie and creative liberties have to be taken to stretch the source material into a film. But is all this really necessary? Does a movie about a talking cat visiting bored kids really have to include this? When the cat finally does show up, the movie begins to move along at a faster pace. The creative team was pretty inventive in finding huge set pieces, which all feel different, to take place in the restricted setting of a single home. Such as this scene where the cat hosts a cooking infomercial. That's impossible! You're not just wrong, you're stupid. Now wait just a minute! And you're ugly, just like your mum. I never fully appreciated this cutaway joke with him and the attorneys afterwards. I'm not saying we're going to sue. I'm just saying we have a case. We'll talk later. Ixnay, Ixnay. But it's just so ridiculous that I can't help but laugh now as an adult. I also love that the cat himself becomes a Mike Myers character, with him inhabiting many different costumes and personalities as the cat. Okay, I have a problem with the word dog. I don't use the D word per se, because I think it's really, really wrong. Yeah. But I will happily hold your canine American. Yeah. Maybe it's because I grew up watching the guy, but I just don't find Myers to be that annoying here. 
I mean, can you imagine Tim Allen doing this? He made a mess in the house, that's why they sent him to a vet who cut off both his boo. 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 Unlike the Grinch movie, which found the need to give the Grinch a tragic backstory that inspired his mean-spirited persona, I like that this movie doesn't explain much about who the cat is. We know little about him or where he came from, and that's really all we have to know. Where did you come from? My place! What do you think? <laughs> I hate that I'm about to make this comparison again, but like Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka, the character's mysterious background only adds to his charm. We don't need to know where Willy Wonka came from to- SON OF A BITCH! Another element from the book that's added here that doesn't really work for me is the talking pet fish. It would have been a different story if fish always talked in this universe, as seemed to be the case in the book, but the fact that the fish here only starts talking after the cat shows up is just an odd choice. The fish is talking! Well sure he can talk, but is he saying anything? No, not really. No. I know he's a pretty big part of the book, but it just doesn't fit the world of this movie. And that's why- <laughs> Another thing, or should I say things that don't really work, as countless others have pointed out, is Thing 1 and Thing 2. He says you may feel free to call him Thing A if you like. He will also accept Super Thing Thing King Kid Dynamite Chocolate Thunder or Dead. I think the design is the problem here as well as the fact that the Things were played by two child actresses. It gives them this weird, uncanny valley look. I would have much rather they had been played by great character actors. Maybe someone like Deep Roy. But fortunately, the movie doesn't give them too much screen time. Eventually, the story does have to get these characters out of the house, though. Dirty ho! And it does feel refreshing to see all of these sets exist practically. I admire the craftsmanship and detail that went into creating this world. When the cat and kids venture into the nightmare-inducing world of their transformed house, there's still a lot of great practical set design. Even if I'm convinced this segment only exists for the potential to turn it into a theme park ride, at least the movie has the guts to be honest about it, though. It's like a ride in an amusement park! You mean like at... Universal Studios! <laughs> the movie wraps up and the credits roll at only an hour and 15 minutes. It's obvious the studio didn't have faith in this movie and they just wanted to cut as much out as possible. The DVD showcases a ton of surreal deleted scenes. There's one that made me laugh way more than it should have. Not only is it a great callback... Oh. That's my mom. Awkward. It's just the cat's expression here is perfect. It's like Dan Aykroyd acknowledging his penis nose and nothing but trouble without saying anything. And speaking of the DVD, by the way, it has the most annoying menu design I have ever seen. Look how long it takes before you can select any options. <sighs> that was rather rude. I thought it was pretty cool. You would. You should. Oh, hello there. I'm Sally, and welcome to the Cat in the Hat DVD. And I'm Connor. And if you click over here, I'll show you some real cool stuff about the film. Okay, stop talking. Or if you click on my side, I'll tell you some amazing stories about how they made the movie. We get it. Don't I want to play the movie. Stop talking. Boring. Click over here. The words are okay, boring. stop talking, please. Remember the fish. The movie, like The Grinch three years prior, opened during the holiday season in 2003. Despite a huge marketing push, including lots of merchandise, Son of a and coming in at number one, it failed to reach the same financial success as its predecessor. Boo. 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 Which, honestly, why would it have? Part of the reason the Grinch movie did so well was because it was a Christmas movie released at Christmas time. Why would a movie that has nothing to do with the holidays do well? Like I said at the start, it's not a very good movie. Watching it again for this retrospective, even if some parts made more sense to me as an adult, the same parts I found grating as a kid are still grating now. But the notion that it's unwatchable or that Mike Myers ruins the character is a little dramatic. Look, the bottom line is, outside of the original half-hour TV specials, which still managed to expand upon the stories of Dr. Seuss without going overboard, 
none of these stories should have been adapted to feature films. And they shouldn't be in the future either. There's just only so much you can squeeze out of these stories. I don't see how making them animated is any more respectful to the source material than this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least I can look at The Grinch and this film and appreciate the hard work that went into building and designing these amazing practical worlds. Sure, it's juvenile, crass, and definitely grating at times, but at least there's some good in here too. The sets, the makeup, the effects, and most of the performances are all pretty inventive and fun. The humor is just so out there and bizarre that I couldn't help but appreciate it as a kid, and I still do today. It's kind of like a doorway which leads from this world to my world. But it says made in the Philippines. Yes, but not this Philippines. But so ends our story on the live-action Cat in the Hat, a movie that's worth remembering at that. It's really not that bad, at least that's my view. It's certainly much better than The Love Guru. But that, my friends, is, as they say, a video retrospective for another day. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your gnome. Name! You are a midget. Son of a bitch!